We're going to go ahead and start our last presentation for this virtual conference. Uh, our final presentation today comes from Julie Graish. Julie is Biological Program Manager at BioWorks. Julie has 14 years of experience as a biological scientist and entomologist, practiced in laboratory, greenhouse, and field research, as well as biological technical service support for the integrated pest management industry. She has been with BioWorks for 15 months as Biological Program Manager and has previously held positions at BASF, Becker Underwood, and Ohio State University. So take it away, Julie. Uh, well, hello and good afternoon, and thank you all for being with us here today. Uh, again, my name is Julie Gresh, and I'm going to be talking about using biopesticides as well as natural enemies for management of thrips and whiteflies. And these are two pests that um, have really cropped up this year, uh, which is why I wanted to focus on them. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was some things that I found as really important factors in biocontrol-based integrated pest management. So the first thing is you need to have really good sanitation practices, and sanitation should be the cornerstone of any integrated pest management system. You do have to have a preventative mindset when using biocontrol-based bio IPM. You can still be reactive when you do when you're working in an IPM type system, but you still need to have that overall preventative outlook. Scouting is incredibly important, and that's going to tell you when you need um, what what pest you have and and what you need to do about that pest um, based on the, the counts. Record keeping is also something that isn't always talked about, but is incredibly important because. This will tell you things like, what did you use in the past? Uh, was it effective? Uh, what pests did you have? Did it occur in a certain location? Why did it occur in that location? Um, what rates did you use? What, what was your application interval? Who did the application? So recording all that information will help you uh, in the now by looking back in the past and seeing what you did, what worked, what didn't work, and that will help you make intelligent decisions today. You do need to repeat biocontrol, um, whether it's biopesticides or biological control agents or natural enemies regularly based upon need. Pest ID is essential, especially if you're working with um, natural enemy populations. Compatibility is an important factor. I'm only going to touch on it here because I'm going to talk about it in, in future slides, but it is incredibly important, and um, we're going to get to that in a minute. Finally, be savvy. Uh, just there's so much to know about biological control and all the things uh, like you need to know the, the life cycle of, of your pest. And if you're using natural enemies, you need to understand their life cycle and what stages of the pest is controlled by the biocontrol agents and um, timing and um, environmental conditions. And so there's so many things that, that you have to be taking into consideration. And, um, but, but you're not alone. And so my, my plea here is ask for help if you need it. Uh, the biocontrol companies and uh, consultants, we want you to be successful in your IPM programs. So the goal here is to start with lower numbers and keep those, uh, those levels low. We're not eradicating with biocontrol. We're just keeping them at a, um, a level that you can control them um, reliably. So there's a variety of uh, tools in the toolbox. And uh, so once again, you need to have a preventative mindset and you need to, uh, to, to do a lot of these things uh, before, during, and even after you're done with um, your, your crop. So once again, sanitation is incredibly important, cleaning up those crop residues, disinfecting benches, so on and so forth. Uh, exclusion, making sure you have good screens and knowing uh, once again, using those, those scouting techniques to know where and why some of those hotspots occur. Cultural methods like um, doing mass trappings with really uh, long sticky cards, 
And irrigation and fertilization, uh, is, uh, you really need to have those dialed in because if you don't, those can just contribute to your pest problems, both insects and diseases. And um, um, so those are also really important factors. So then we get over to your control methods. So biopesticides, which is the main um, topic of our, our discussion today. So we're gonna be talking about enema pathogenic fungus, which just means insect killing, insect growth regulators, um, oils and naturally derived pesticides. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those in just a few minutes. The, I, I wanna end this slide with talking about natural enemies, such as predators and parasitoids. So when we're talking about specifically thrips and whiteflies, there is some carryover of natural enemies that are gonna kill both whiteflies and thrips. However, there's also a lot of specialists. So you do need to know what natural enemies are gonna go after what pest species. I have a pitchfork here in this picture because, um, so th the things that we've talked about so far, these are, are tools in your toolbox. However, that doesn't necessarily tell you when and uh, what and um, uh, when, when and what biocontrol agents or, or biopesticides to use and how many at what time. So um, I like to think about biocontrol programs as a pitchfork approach. You do need to go at a lot of these infestations um, of insects or diseases with uh, the mindset of, I need to, to control um, using multiple control agents at the same time. And that is important, especially when using natural enemies because, and let's let's look at a, uh, a thrips starting off. So this is a simplified life cycle of a thrip. So you have eggs, larvae, pupae, adults. And then we have some natural enemies and some biopesticides here. So typically, um, natural enemies only go after a specific life stage or a few specific life stages of the insect. So you do have a couple options for the larval stage of thrips, you have some options for the pupal stage of thrips, and you have some options for your adult stages. And those don't always carry over um, from one stage to the next. So you do need to know, um, and you would need to apply several of these biocontrol agents for a, a complete program. Um, one thing I want to mention here is not all thrips pupate in the soil. Uh, things like echinothrips will all pupate on the plant, and so you need to maybe have a different strategy there. And then, of course, you have the biopesticides. Kind of like your natural enemies, not all biopesticides are going to go after all life stages. So, for instance, uh, Moltex, which is an insect growth regulator, that's only going to go after your immature stages. Um, some of the, the other ones, Suffoil, Botanigard Max, and uh, Botanigard, those are going to go after um, several life stages. So then if we look at the white fly, kind of in the same program here, we have a couple of different options on uh, parasitoids, which are your wasps. But once again, pest ID is incredibly important because some of those parasitoids are gonna be very specific for instance, in Carcia formosa, that's only going to go after your greenhouse white flies. So if you have silver leaf white flies um, and you apply uh, formosa, you're not going to get control. So um, there's a couple of different parasitoid options there. Make sure you know what species of um, white fly that you have. And there's also some options that you have for predators such as uh, predatory mites and a generalist predator, Dicyphus hesperus. And again, the arrows just um, tell you where those um, predators or parasitoids are gonna be um, taking out the insect population. Once again, we have um, the biopesticides. And once again, just depends on the life stage on which one, um, which life stage the, the biopesticides control as well. So now this gives you an idea of the control agents you can use, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how to truly integrate the natural enemies and the biopesticides. So let's talk about that for just a second. So first of all, 
if you have a really high insect um, pest uh, uh, pressure, then you may want to consider using the biopesticides because it takes time for your natural enemies to grow in population with their pest um, or their host. And so that takes time. And if you need, if, if, if you're insect population is too high, you may need to bring in those biopesticides um, to spot treat or overall treat to bring down your insect populations. And then you can make um, more releases of your, bio, uh, your, your natural enemies. Dipping is a really great way to integrate uh, biopesticides and BCAs because um, for, first of all, it's gonna control um, a lot of the starting population um, that you get in on those cuttings. You wanna start clean so you stay clean. And if you bring insects in, you're gonna be battling them all along. So uh, dipping is a great method for controlling a lot of um, insects and mites and even diseases. Compatibility. This is, once again, it's, it's important, and, and I'm going to continue to talk about it um, in a little bit later. But in this sense, let's just talk about compatibility with BCAs and biopesticides. And it's the, really the answer here for each one of these categories is it depends. Sometimes bioinsecticides um, are going to be compatible, and sometimes they're not. So just because it's a bioinsecticide doesn't mean it's not going to kill a natural enemy. Um, once again, there are great um, compatibility information out there in the industry. Um, so same, kind of the same story with the biofungicides. Sometimes it, it just depends. So a product like Cease or Botry Stop are going to be safe for foliar um, natural enemies, but things like Mill Stop, which is a potassium bicarbonate, is going to be less compatible with your BCAs. Um, and then chemicals. Uh, th this one's really tricky, and uh, because uh, um, it, it's going to be harsher on your BCA population. So uh, an example is mainspring drenched to a soil, and um, this would be compatible with your foliar predators, such as wasps, predatory mites, and aureus. However, that's not going to be compatible with your soil predators, such as delosia, which is the rove beetle. Spot treating is a really great thing to integrate biopesticides and BCAs, because um, if you're doing a lot of BCAs, you don't want to kill everything. And um, if you're using something like a stuff oil that is going to be a little bit more broad spectrum and it's going to kill any BCAs that it contacts, if you spot treat like, say, a mite population where it could be a little bit more spotty um, uh, distributed, then um, you're going to preserve the greater BCA population. And then since you've only treated one area, you can come in with BCAs and uh, reapply those so that it, can, it will clean up any uh, insects that are left um, that, the, that the biopesticide didn't control. And finally, just timing of applications. There's a lot of things to think about here. Um, one, I, one example for you would be to um, if you know that you are going to need to make an application of, of um, natural enemies, you could come in with a biopesticide right before that uh, to clean up any insect uh, populations or just lower the population of insects before you release your natural enemies. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the biopesticides. Now these are both going to work, uh, these, these biopesticides are going to work equally well for your thrips and your whiteflies. So the first product that I want to talk about is Botanigard, which is also available in a product called Mycotrol. It's just a slightly different formulation. Mycotrol is um, WSDA organic certified. And both of those come in a wettable powder and an ES formulation. The active ingredient here is Bavaria bassiana strain GHA. Botanigard Max has that same active ingredient of Bavaria bassiana, but it also incorporates pyrethrin. So this is a little bit more of a, um, a knockdown if you have heavy, uh, higher populations. Um, pyrethrins uh, do have shorter, uh, shorter residuals. So um, 
you can come, it, it's not going to be compatible with all of the BCAs, but you can come in and um, re-release in a, a short period of time um, and not harm the, BC, the, the BCAs that you um, reapply. Moltex is a 3% as direct, and this is an insect growth regulator and a fantastic rotational or tank mix partner with Botanigard and Mycotrol. The reason for this is, so if you have insects like thrips and whiteflies that have really fast life cycles, especially in the warm summer months, um, they're cranking through their life cycle. And if you apply uh, Bavaria bassiana spores, and if the insect sheds its skin before the botanigard fungus germinates and penetrates the insect's cuticle and starts the infection process, those spores can just actually be shed off, and um, botanigard will no longer be effective. So you need something to slow the life cycle down of the insect to make botanigard work much better. So Moltex is a fantastic um, synergistic product with botanigard. Highly, highly recommended with insects with fast life cycles. Finally, Suffoil X is an 80% pre-emulsified horticultural mineral oil. And this is a great broad spectrum oil for controlling things like insects, mites, a great mite product, uh, and it will kill um, both uh, the, the mobile life stages as well as eggs, as well as powdery mildew. So I wanted to go into a, just a little bit more detail um, on some important factors when using biopesticides. First, I'm gonna talk about why you should consider using biopesticides, and then I'm going to talk about some factors that could affect the efficacy. So first, you should use biopesticides over um, over um, synthetic pesticides uh, because they have relatively low REIs and um, no or very short pre-harvest intervals. They're safer for workers, consumers, and the environment they uh, manage pesticide residues, and this can be important when you're dealing with uh, food crops or smokable crops. Um, you can reduce uh, the resistance to, um, to uh, reduce, re oh, excuse me, you can reduce resistance to synthetic pesticides. So for instance, if you have a, a pest that is resistant to chemicals, and thrips and whiteflies are very susceptible to resistance. Biopesticides typically have multiple modes of action and have a physical mode, uh, and also physical modes of action. So for instance, you can't become resistant to being eaten or uh, suffocated, um, or if there's multiple modes of action, it's hard to become resistant to that as well. So it's going to take out those resistant insects. So it's a really great rotational um, um, products to use when you have insect resistance. You can trigger induced plant resistance, so using the plant to um, uh, turn on its natural mechanism for controlling pests and diseases uh, depends on the, the product that you use. Uh, biopesticides can improve plant health, soil, and environmental health over time with continued use. And finally, consumer demand, and that gets a little, you know, to the, the green industry and um, managing pesticide residues. So secondly, some factors that are going to affect the efficacy. So first, we have uh, shelf life and storage. This is really important. Um, so many times um, people will, will call and say, we used your product and it didn't work, and we'll ask, how did you store it? And it's stored in the greenhouse or something, and they've had it for four years. And so especially if you're using something that's living, you need to know what the shelf life is because it's going to be shorter than chemistry. And you also need to know how to store it um, for maximum shelf life and efficacy. Compatibility, once again, now we're going to change gears and think about compatibility in the biopesticide pesticide sense. So there's a physical compatibility. Are, they, are, are two components physically compatible? But there's also a biological compatibility. So if you're doing like the Bavaria bassiana botanic garden, if you're combining that with a, a fungicide, is that going to kill the spores? And so um, 
you, you need to know that. And so in the upper right hand corner, you can see just an example of um, a compatibility test. And uh, you don't, so you want to make sure that your, your tank mix partners as well as your rotational partners are compatible with your bio, fungus, uh, bio uh, pesticides. Also, just like I said earlier, just because it's about biopesticide doesn't mean it's going to be compatible with natural enemies. So there are really great compatibility guides in the industry. So all you have to do is reach out and ask for them or find them. Poor coverage and incorrect timing are primary causes for biopesticide failures. A lot of these biopesticides are contact. So if you don't get them on the underside of the leaf where most of these insects are hiding, you're not gonna get good efficacy. Application equipment is important. If you don't get good coverage, you're not gonna get good efficacy. Application interval and rate. If you have higher insect populations, you need to have a higher rate and potentially a, a, a shorter interval. And then you can um, adjust that based on the insect population. Uh, insect or disease species is important, um, as we mentioned with the natural enemies. Um, less so with, with biopesticide, but some biopesticides are specific. So you, it, it's, it's still an important thing to know. Uh, potting media, so like for instance, if you compare like a rock wool or an oasis to um, the traditional um, potting media of peat or um, um, cocoa choir, that's gonna that's gonna affect um, how biopesticides and natural enemies work. Uh, fertility regime, um, if you need to uh, you need to crank out your your um, your crop, you add more nitrogen, you're also feeding your insect population. And that is going to affect um, how quickly they're reproducing and, and it can um, cause a lot of problems for you. So it's not always good to bump up. Um, you need to control how much fertilizer you put on and don't over apply. Finally, uh, BCA placement is also incredibly important. So for instance, in the lower right-hand corner, um, the, the mite sachet is on the edge of the pot, not touching the plant. And it looks like you know the, the grower put it in timeout. <laughs> and so you need to make sure that you're applying those BCAs properly so that you get the best bang for your buck. So I wanted to share just a couple of research slides with you before um, before I conclude. Uh, this is a study done out of Vineland Research and Innovation Center, and this is a greenhouse study done on poinsettias. And the pest species here is echinothrips, and uh, they're they used three different enema pathogenic fungus, again insect killing fungus, um, an Isaria, a Bavaria and a metarizium. And all three of those did a really nice job of controlling the echinothrips, anywhere from 70 to 90% mortality. What's really important to know here is that echinothrips are much larger than a lot of the, um, like a Western flower thrip and a chili thrip. And so your, uh, your predatory mite species aren't gonna work as well on the larval stages. So this is an opportunity for, if you have this pest, you probably wanna use more of a biopesticide program. Next, I wanted to just show, share a slide with uh, Sufwale X. This is another study done in 2011 on roses. This is a 1% application. Um, four applications were applied 10 days apart. And as you can see, um, they, they looked at both two-spotted spider mite and white fly, for, and this is Bumesia, uh, so silver leaf. And they uh, had eight, over 80% mortality of both of those species um, with those applications. I didn't share this data with you, but it, this also really uh, resulted in a, a 58% yield increase on roses um, in comparison to the untreated control. My last data slide is, uh, this is a dip study. Again, this was done at Vineland. And um, this is a really interesting study in that they are doing both dips followed by BCAs. So the, the dark blue line um, on the top, that's that's basically your not treated control. So no dip, no bios. And then the blue dotted line is your no dip, but you're doing bios. And then um, the, the red and the yellow are uh, a either botanagard or landscape oil 
as a dip, but no bios, and Botanigard or landscape oil plus bios. And the takeaway message here is uh, both of those, um, either the dip without bios and the dip with bios, did really well in controlling um, thrips. However, the dip plus bio program was by far the best. So this slide is just to bring it all together um, and and just uh, in a program sense. So once again, you need to make sure that you always have those um, cultural um, practices in place, so the sanitation and exclusion. Um, dipping is an important thing if you're bringing in cuttings. Uh, putting out sachets or broadcasting and propagation with the doing the mites, uh, incorporating the biopesticides and incorporating additional biocontrols as you transplant and as the plants get bigger. Um, also, you may need to change your, your tactics with your natural enemies as the plants get bigger. Um, go from some from maybe sachets to um, hanging sachets. Um, incorporating different bios as the plant gets bigger or different biopesticides based on what insects that you have. Um, and then of course, you, since this is integrated pest management, um, you do also have the toolbox um, and, the bio, and, and the pesticides or the fungicides. And just once again, making sure that those are compatible. So uh, uh, my last slide here is uh, just that BioWorks has a lot of really great biopesticide and biological control agent or natural enemy programs that, um, and guides that we have online, as well as compatibility information. Um, so you can go to our website or contact us directly and we will get that information for you. And with that, uh, I would love to take any questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Julie. Um, first question that we have for you is, what are some of the advantages of the Suff Oil X over other oils? So uh, that's a really great question. Um, so for instance, uh, Suff Oil is an 80%, and I think that's a fairly unique thing in the market, 80% um, oil versus like a, a, a 90 uh, uh, 95 plus percent oil. So what we've done is we've emulsified the the suff oil so that the oil particle size has been broken down um, to a, basically about the size of a human skin cell, so incredibly tiny, so that when you put that into solution, it stays into solution a lot longer um, because those those oil particles are so small. So if you had a traditional oil, uh, and if you tried to put that in water, you could mix it up and you'd get a variety of oil particle sizes. And some of those really large oil particle sizes are going to rise to the surface of the, the water um, much faster. And that is going to cause, uh, potentially cause um, uh, differences in application rate. Um, and and it could cause a phytotoxicity issue at the end because there would be more oil at the top. So it's, it stays into solution a lot better. Um, the pre-emulsified formulation um, and the small oil particle size, it penetrates once you spray it out in a, in a fine droplet size. Um, it penetrates the canopy a lot better. It, it coats the leaf in a very, very thin layer so that it allows the plant to continue to respire and transpire so it's not going to cause that phytotoxicity issue typically. Um, um, and and um, and it will also coat the insect really well, get into the spiracles of the breathing tubes and uh, cause the insect or uh, powdery mildew, if that's what you're going after, um, to, to suffocate. Um, and so there, there's a lot of really, really great um, benefits to, to suff oil over some of the traditional ones where you um, where they're nearly 100% um, oils. And what can you mix in a dip tank? And if you are using a dip, um, is there a possibility that it will spread disease? Ooh, ooh, good questions. Okay, so there, uh, the, there's a variety of things that you can put in dip tanks and there's a lot of uh, products. Uh, make sure you look at the labels. 
and make sure that dipping is allowed. If you're using oils, you need to make sure that you don't do it at a spray rate. Um, it is a much, much lower rate than, than the spray rate, and yet we don't want you to, to harm your cuttings. Um, things that you can put in there, Botanigard and, and Mycotrol, so the Bavaria bassianas, um, or various um, um, enema pathogenic fungus. Um, I mentioned a couple others um, with Isaria and Metarhizium. Um, root Shield, which is uh, Trichoderma. Um, nematodes uh, like Nemashield is our, our great um, um, dip tank partners, or things like OnGuard. OnGuard is a, a, a liquid fertilizer. So all these things are going to either kill insects, kill diseases, uh, or uh, help your plant grow better um, if there's uh, you know some some of that like the fertilizers in there um, more evenly once once stuck um, and on the disease part uh, once again I'm going to bring up Vineland because Vineland does, has done a lot of dip research and they actually did a dip trial where they had um, inoculated the cuttings with Erwinia and they they dipped and then they stuck them and then they they looked for the the Erwinia after they had been stuck and what they found was the only time that um was when the only time that there was a problem is when the Erwinia was really high concentration in the dip solution so m my point here is Typically, dips will not spread disease. However, it's really important that you change out dip solutions regularly. So once you start getting to the bottom of the dip solution, don't just add new material on top. Get rid of it, disinfect it, your, your, all of your equipment, and then start over with a new solution. Um, and as long as you do that, there should not be any concerns. Okay, well, that's all the time that we have today. Thank you so much for joining us, Julie, and thanks to everyone who attended today, and thanks so much for joining us. Have a good rest of your week.